Welcome to this online meeting in our series of open lectures from the Learning Lab of University Duisburg Essen. Uh, today we have a special event and we are able to look at higher education in different countries and uh, maybe we will get an idea of the similarities but also on differences that we encounter in universities uh, and how they cope uh, with the current situation with the uh, crisis. The aim of the series uh, is to look at the various sectors of education and uh, get uh, and to get a short insight into the current discussion. What are the trends, the topics uh, within these uh, sectors? Um, typically, at the Learning Lab, we cooperate very closely with uh, partners from all these fields. Uh, we we are engaged in projects to develop uh, educational technology and to, to develop uh, educational innovations which currently is very difficult to, to, to do. And therefore, this is a, just a small um, exercise uh, to get a view into the various sectors from secondary education to adult education. So today, I'm uh, glad to have two scholars uh, from Europe uh, joining our discussion. And um, we will um, first uh, maybe introduce, uh, maybe you, you, you might want to introduce yourself, um, uh, where you're coming from, what is your topic, what is your current view on uh, this topic. Sarah, maybe you want to start. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, Michael, thank you very much for inviting me, um, for inviting me alongside Peter, who I've worked with for some years. And uh, it's really, really nice to be here with your students and your colleagues um, to talk about this, this topic. So I'm from um, the University of Wolverhampton. I work in a research centre which is called the Education Observatory. And uh, it's located at a place called Walsall, which is one of our campuses. But University of Wolverhampton has several different campuses and they're all not so far from Birmingham, if people know Birmingham in the UK. And my role as a professor in higher education policy is an interesting one. It's a, a research and teaching role, but largely I work with research students, work on research grants and uh, work on what the UK has, which is called the uh, Research Excellence Framework, um, this, these kinds of things. Although in the past I've taught in education, sociology, um, a little in computing and, and these kinds of things as well. So uh, that's, that's me um, for a start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sarah. Peter, you're coming from Croatia and uh, I have read your first love uh, is and was physics, but then you were infected by Frankfurt School and turned to critical pedagogy uh, that I read from your biography uh, and, and, and uh, you have been to our university uh, recently but maybe you can introduce yourself also shortly. <clears throat> also, good morning and herzlich willkommen zu unserer Veranstaltung. Michael, oh. vielen Dank, dass du mich hierher eingeladen hast. Entschuldigung für meine schlechte Deutsch. Leider werden Sie diese Sitzung of English machen. Okay, so I'll just move to English. I did learn, I did learn German for a while in school, but never really, I never really learned it properly. So Google Translate is my friend. Uh, as I said, thanks a lot for inviting me here. I am, uh, my background is in natural sciences, my background is in physics, but then I moved through the Frankfurt School of uh, towards, towards uh, educational technologies. And now, actually, probably the biggest thing I'm doing at the moment is leading this uh, post-digital science and educational journal with Springer, which is, uh, which is now in its second year and which kind of develops pretty well at the moment. So my interest is really all social aspects of using technology in education, all those intersections between from philosophy through social sciences even a bit of humanities uh, now in my role as an editor i'm a bit of a jack of all trades but in my personal for me what i'm what i'm personally interested in is revolves very much around dialogue around collective intelligences around ways in which we can develop a, 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 a some new ways of uh, doing research and understanding actually mm -hmm. the world 
that we inhabit at the moment, which is quite complex and quite difficult. I was in your city. Uh, it's, 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 I really enjoyed it. And, and actually, and your university was also really, really, really quite familiar. For me, in a way, I actually work in a Fachhochschule. So it's kind of, it's a kind of a university which comes from very much from a German tradition. And so there's a lot of even cultural similarity in my work uh, in a sense that I, that there is always some kind of practical application going on in the background. We try to be theoretical, we try to be philosophical, but in the end of the day, we always also want to have some kind of practice there. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's enough for me. Yes, probably. thank you, Peter. Uh, we, we're, you've already talked about your university, and, and, and could you describe how, how your current experience is uh, working uh, as, a, as, a, as a teacher, working as a scholar with your university? I mean, is the university closed? Uh, how, is the, how is educational technology helping to teach? Uh, what, what's your impression of, of, your, of the work at your university? Which of us is that to, Michael? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, to which of us are you asking uh, that? Peter first. I mean, well, I was Peter, just... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, I guess that I'm not probably the more, the best the best example, and I think that Sarah won't be as well. Uh, okay, so let's first... Uh, so I work at the School of Informatics. Mm-hmm. And because of my engagement with digital and distance learning, I have been actually engaged in setting up, developing standards, systems, and so on for distance learning for 10 years now. And actually, all my courses, almost all my courses except one, are online anyway. So I teach online and I I teach about... So for me, it was totally business as usual. In terms of the rest of the school, I was invited with in into some i mean we we did like a task force to help people to move online but since we are speaking about the school of information science and since our students are pretty much people who more than 50 percent of them work anyway and uh, there was no it was i would say it was almost seamless in terms of transformation mm-hmm. what i would like to say although it's maybe not exactly an answer to your, to your question, is that I was also invited to the task force for uh, helping, the tra- for supporting the transition of primary and secondary schools in Croatia. And here we actually had a big, here was actually a much bigger problem. I mean, the main thing really in schools and at the university as well, really the only thing that's really, really, really properly problematic around here, and I guess everywhere else, is assessment. Because what people do, uh, somehow, you know, instruction can be moved online or is already online. People have online materials. For instance, at my university, you cannot actually, uh, to progress from lecture to senior lecture or, or whatever, you actually need to have all your materials for all your co- courses online anyway. I'm not saying that these materials are perfect, but people had something to start with. So, but assessment was a big deal and assessment continues to be a big deal by today. Mm-hmm. You opened an, inter- you, you open an, the, an interesting question just actually very recently. And it's an interesting thing with the corona that it's uneven. So it doesn't really develop the same way at uh, all of the times. So Sarah and I are in touch on daily basis. I have a brother who lives in Edinburgh. We are in touch on daily basis. And the UK is pretty much locked down still. Croatia didn't, hasn't had any new infections for more than a week. Croatia is open. It, it even opened up borders. I just came here. I, I left my son at the, kid, at the kindergarten Schools are opening, universities are opening. And actually, like you said, Michael, it's probably even a bigger problem now to organize coming back than to organize this. And I don't think that we anticipated this. I didn't anticipate this. And in in your article, Michael, you also didn't anticipate this. But actually, looking now, coming back is a huge challenge. And even one month ago, 
because I have this, Sarah and I and some other people are doing this journal post digital science and education. And now we have a lot of papers on the corona. And actually it just occurred me now when you said that actually we asked everybody about going online, but we never asked anybody about mm -hmm. coming back. Yeah. And I think, I think it would be a very useful topic to explore in the journal, by the way. So thanks, thanks very much for your... Yeah, but, yeah. but, 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 but before, before coming back, uh, let's have a look at the, at the current situation because uh, it was very interesting for me when you said, Peter, that, uh, that, that, that teaching online, that was not much of a business, that was not much of a, of a topic, uh, maybe in primary and secondary education, but for higher education, uh, all the teachers have the materials. That was just a small step in a way. And that would, be, I would say that would, is completely different <laughs> with Germany. Uh, so, so, so that's very interesting to hear from you. Uh, but Sarah, let's have a, let's have a, a comment from, from, from can you. I just, sorry, can I just, can I just make sorry. a comment before, before Please, Sarah, yeah. sorry for being pushy. <laughs> I work in the School of Informatics. Yeah. We okay. teach future computer programmers. I'm not saying that departments of history or philology or somebody had, I'm, I was not speaking about Croatia. I was speaking okay. about my experience in the School yes. of Informatics, yeah. which was good. My partner works in the School of Architecture. It was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it very much depends on the discipline. I would not say that Croatia has been yeah. better than others. I would imagine that computer engineers in Germany also did much better than, I don't know, some other field. <laughs> But sorry, Sarah. It's sorry. Okay, no, you. but but you're, but you're right. That's a, that's an important uh, that's an impo important point. Yeah, we, we cannot overgeneralize this. So we have to be careful out there. Thank you. No, but Sarah, how would you interpret this situation? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I'll say a little bit personally, and then a little bit about the institution as well, and and sort of uh, my perceptions of of where some of the universities are really. Um, so here I, I actually live in Worcester. I live about 40 miles away from where I work and I haven't been near to where I work ever since the start of March, which we were just literally, uh, we couldn't enter the building, we couldn't uh, travel. And I was in Scotland at the time that the uh, lockdown was, was just about to happen. My son, eldest son, was in um, a place in the north of uh, England studying and uh, we made the decision, even though we weren't supposed to travel, to retrieve him um, because then he could then continue at home and work online. Otherwise, he would have been isolated in a student accommodation with nobody else at all. So, you know, this, this is a sort of uh, the quick decision that we made. And my other son has uh, been try seeking work, which is extremely difficult in this time. So, you know, you get sort of gradually into your own family bubble here. And, uh, you know, you're teaching or, or you're presenting or you're conducting meetings. Um, when you're not getting yourself dressed usually for work and these kind of things and it it places a whole different dynamic for everyone but I think it's actually one that's been quite positive in terms of I think there is a much friendlier approach to a lot of the technologies that some people are struggling with at the minute and uh, unlike Peter's department many people in the University of Wolverhampton will have been teaching in face-to-face -face situations or potentially blended situations, but largely they will have had to scramble to do what they're doing uh, in an online situation. So I think, you know, grappling with the software and the needs of the support needs of students will have been huge. And although that hasn't been something that I have personally had to do in the recent weeks, um, because I've, I've worked more, more with research students, um, I talked to colleagues and some of them are taking a, an approach where they will um, put what they can online for students to access when they can and work perhaps at different rates of, you know, to each other. Whereas others are arguing, I need the whole class together. I need a way to be able to talk to them all together in real time. And of course, some subjects can't translate very easily at all. In terms of research students, we have many of them who have taken leave of absence because they can't collect their data. Mm -hmm. And many of them have family commitments anyway. Um, you have students in exactly the same situations as us with caring, with teaching at uh, their children at home 
um, some of them having to pay rent for student accommodation they're not in. And so, you know, there is this whole collection of things that have sort of uh, blown up so quickly for all of us, um, you know, that it is, is really quite a challenge. And I think within each um, context for my own, suddenly perhaps one of the challenges I arose to was um, suddenly being invited to chair PhD Vivas online. So to quickly get to know the software, but to be responsible for the examiners and the student um, and trying to make sure that everybody had backup if software went wrong, that we followed regulations, that, you know, that we could conduct all of that. So, so yes, I think those are some of uh, the experiences that I could say um, from Wolverhampton. Um, one other thing just to comment about this coming back to campus. Naturally, we have uh, vice chancellor and senior managers who are looking into how we can do this. And uh, I think a lot of the Midlands universities are looking at potentially phased returns for certain groups. Meanwhile, we have universities like Cambridge who are just saying, no, everything is online. We will be doing it all online. And of course, one of the things you don't know is whether they will be doing it well or not so well online, um, you know, because again, um, it can be very costly, a lot of planning to um, to try to do these things. And then we have the University of Bolton has just hit the news because they are doing, like yourselves, the kind of arrangements to bring students back to campus and to have screens and to have protective um, uh, things put in place. So, so we have these, the, you know, these big differences across universities at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, but that sounds that uh, the, the universities are quite autonomous to, to, to find their, 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 their own strategy. Uh, certainly, that is something that um, has its pros and its cons. I think it's hugely important. I think academic autonomy and autonomy within aspect, you know, different uh, parts of universities is terribly important. But at the moment, um, I think the UK kind of resembles a little bit. If you can imagine, uh, when you work centrally sometimes, it's easy to think that faculties are not very connected with the centre and vice versa. You can work in a faculty and you can think, oh, the centre doesn't understand us. And it's a little bit like that with in and around the UK government and the whole set of universities that at the moment we don't quite have a, a more coherent plan for everything going forward in the longer term. So universities are taking their decisions. They have been disappointed to find that the government is not bailing out in the way that they hoped financially. Mm. And so, uh, you know, boards of, um, uh, you know, uh, senates and um, uh, councils in universities are having to make decisions perhaps much more within the institutions rather than perhaps across a whole body of institutions. Um, and then we have a regulator, of course, in the UK, the Office for Students, who will also be trying to come to grips with what regulation looked like before the lockdown, what regulation might look like afterwards. And they could be you know, quite different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, do you also experience that, that these, that these um, the, like the Senate or, or these, these uh, groups are, 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 I mean, are they still working? I mean, they, are they still operating and making decisions? Is that possible? I mean, is the kind of ways of democracy uh, within a university, do they operate? Yes, I think very much so. And in the past, I've been involved with such groups, perhaps a little more when I've worked centrally. Um, and uh, we get regular updates from our vice chancellor and from people. Uh, we have a research dean that we work closely with on research excellence framework and research funding bids. Um, so we have these kinds of connections going on. And then obviously they are trying to keep people up to date with the university thinking. And we have a, a, a strategy in our own university, which is um, universities like um, uh, phrases, a little bit like the government has had a, a stay safe and stay alert and this kind of thing. And so um, the Wolverhampton one is recommence um, recovery and revival. And these will be the sorts of phases that strategically they'll be thinking through how the university works in, you know, in, in these phases, um, you know, and, and what kind of way they may now need to look again at curriculum design and which courses they offer 
and prioritize which ones cannot be prioritized for all the, the reasons we've said. Mm-hmm. But I think we, we are looking at some really major changes. What we don't know is the time scale of those changes, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, changes. Uh, but first of all, a simple question uh, for you two, uh, for both of you. Uh, I mean, is that all done with video conferencing or how do you uh, communicate with your committees and, and, and your, your, your peers? Um, lots uh, of video conferences all day long? For, for us, it's Microsoft Teams is very um, active. And uh, well, when I had to chair, I have another one of these vivas to chair soon. That's very helpful because what you find is all of the paperwork you can do in real time with the examiners, sign everything off. Mm-hmm. This would happen in a, a campus situation and things would be sent around and take time over email. So, but in terms of committee meetings, I, you know, I generally found these kinds of things a bit more relaxed. People are commenting on the child that walks in, the, mm-hmm. the, the cat or the dog that's um you know joining in <laughs> and and these kinds of things you know so um i don't think communication has has in a sense been as challenging as when we're all busy on campus mm-hmm. peter how, how's your work i mean how are you how do you organize your work and your corporations within the university video conferences while sarah, all day talking, long. <laughs> while sarah was talking i just tried to find uh, an application they sent us a few days ago, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. So sorry for clicking. So, well, for us, it's also, it's mostly been asynchronous. So mm-hmm. we don't meet face to face. The programming team has has put in place a system for anonymous, anonymous electronic voting which I was hoping to find and then share my screen, but that's I amazing. Can, oh. But I cannot find it right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of organization, it's it's and then then communication. It's mostly emails. Uh, but I teach through Moodle anyway, so it all really depends <laughs> on 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 how other people teach. Um, in t- so yes, in terms of administration, I would say that we it was usually. Yes, they, there is quite a lot of Microsoft Teams, but then my university also has its own cloud somehow. So there's something is it is is in this kind of widely developed cloud, and then there's also and then there's also a lot going on in terms of uh, these pieces of software which we don't really which we haven't really used perhaps for for a while, but now people are finding them really useful, such as, uh, for instance, people are, there, there are two clouds. So we have the official Microsoft cloud because creation government in all its wisdom buys Microsoft and then gives it for free to, mm-hmm. to, 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 to all higher educational institutions in the country. But then the Google has grown rapidly, so now people are using Google, although there's a problem with GDPR and so on, but people just cannot be bothered with Microsoft, so they use they so so they keep officially things on Microsoft but actually work on Google mm-hmm. then there's then there's uh, as I said been been a surge of so yeah, somebody remembered that we actually do have an Adobe Connect license as well like the network learning conference was used. So there's some Adobe Connect together with together with the Zoom, of course. And I still contact my students on Skype because I have them on Skype from ages ago. Uh, and then there's also a lot of a lot of other things which are so there's the, this like internal private web which uh, because I work in the School of Computing, then whoever thinks of something, some, somehow they just program something and then dump it there. And it's a huge mess of various <laughs> applications, half of which don't really work well. Uh-huh. But now some of these applications have been fixed and now some of these applications have started to work. So actually it was one thing which is really important. I know, I'm not sure how you, how you deal with this in, in, your, in your situations, 
was that for us, in order to, to mark students, in order to officially enter marks in the system, the only way authentication that our systems would accept was basically IP based. So in order to enter my students' marks, I had to download the VPN and work around to pretend that I'm at the actual institution. And before it was forbidden. So uh, when, you sp when you speak about all these challenges, like, like all these applications and so on, probably the biggest challenge, and I'm, I'm a bit involved in this, in this kind of project as well, is a regular updating of regulations and standards which need to be used because you know it's all right if you mess up something at the lecture but if you don't have a but if your vpn the usage of vpn is explicitly forbidden and and you use something that's forbidden to enter student mark into the system then this mark will not be valid so the thing is that all these all these a uh, legal and paralegal uh, framework needs to develop actually quickly together with the applications mm -hmm. since i'm not a computer programmer and most people there are at my university then i'm mostly involved with this other with this other regulation stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really when we speak about all these different ecosystems in, in, and, and technologies which are being used, I think it's, uh, uh, it, it really cannot be emphasized more that together with the, the technology is not just about software, it's about the whole ecosystem from rules, regulations, uh, all these other things that need to be put in place in order for something to work properly. Mm -hmm. And these things are just as important and they've been developing pretty quickly, but obviously they're slower than... So what happens in reality is that people solve their problems in the field. And because we are speaking of mostly computer programmers, then they are really quick in solving the things. Yeah. But, but... And then the legal department and the deans and the vice deans or whoever actually are now looking like this and thinking okay how how do we make this legal now at some point but because that, people, that, people just develop yeah, things yeah but that shows us that 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 uh, the, the situation brings up new practices uh, paralegal you say they bring up new practices and somehow they change our our way of work our the way universities operate and, and, and that, uh, I think, is an important point that I would like to address. Uh, and, and, and the question would be, does the crisis uh, have an impact on, on higher education? Can we, can we already see something uh, in, the, in the long run? Uh, does it impact the way universities are operating? Uh, Sarah, you are a professor of higher education policy, uh, so so I really would be curious to 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 get to know your perspective on 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 this view on this question. Oh well, thank you, thank you for asking. I um, first of all, I would say that um, over the years for research, I have been quite critical of the discourse of the way that higher education policy is constructed particularly in relation to learning technologies, because um, what I've tended to critique and uh, have written jointly with Peter on many occasions too, is the missing out of the more human elements because we tend to attribute, attribute um, actions and things to technologies themselves and we tend to miss out that wealth of work that we know is going on currently in this crisis in order to design appropriately what you do in a, an online situation for students even if it's such a great hurry you know that there are things as a, a teacher that you have to do to to make things work and I think so decades of, of policy that seems almost to have denied this and certainly in UK policies and uh, I've noticed patterns in global policies as well. So it's, um, you know, it's a globalized uh, context that we're in. Um, but it's, it's about, um, you know, really recognizing a lot of work goes into this, a lot of human effort behind, you know, the 
the slick looking technologies, acknowledging that and understanding what this means now that suddenly we're in a crisis situation. Um, and in many ways, I think we can learn from a lot of work that has been done, research that's been done with developing countries and in different contexts in relation to um, migrant situations, populations where technologies have had to be introduced to try to help. And uh, many people have written about the contextual nature of that and how important it is that when you get beyond the initial work with um, uh, somebody in an uh, emotional, physical, um, dangerous situation, when you move towards education, we need then to understand how you apply these technologies in those very localised, contextual situations, or people won't use them, or people won't benefit or be able to, to progress with them. So somewhere in all of this, I think that um, there is potentially a need for us to not disconnect the international work from the local work to understand how we need policy for crisis in what we thought were fairly secure UK institutions that ro rolled on with their committees and their, you know, their slow processes. Suddenly we were without policies. Suddenly we had uh, temporary policies needed to be written very, very quickly. And, you know, these were coming out for people, like whether it's about annual leave, whether it's about something to do with, um, you know, uh, student well-being and mental health. It, you have to suddenly produce very quick um, policies to help people. So I think that that's um, a few sort of reflections on that, really. What I can't get a, an angle on yet is is where we're going to go with all of this. And um, I think it's it's we've spent so long criticising the marketized situation we found ourselves in. I've spent a lot of time criticizing the phrase, the student experience. And I have a lot of concerns for students at the moment that what is it going to look like for them to study at universities where they had so looked forward to the social aspects and the, the things that actually all are part and parcel of a, a university education that they, they simply won't be able to, to have in the same way. And uh, so again, I think it's about now I would like to see us begin to write uh, slightly more honestly in policy the, you know, about the, the changes that are taking place and the, the realities we're facing. Uh, where it quite it goes in terms of the you know, severe economic aspects, um, my only other thoughts are that I do hope that there is a way that we can communicate what universities um, really do in terms of society we could do that a little better you know in terms of how important university work and uh, university education is for economy society uh, humanity really I would like us to be able to to find ways to communicate that in in broader society and to be uh, uh, much more interconnected with our local communities I think mm -hmm. Many, many aspects you, you have mentioned, and, uh, but, but they all relate to really to the question of what is a university and what, what's the contribution of a university to society and, okay. and how can we ensure that, that the university uh, is not treated as a somehow as a, as a somehow making revenues and and, okay. uh, and, and, and and making certificates, but, but also really looking at the, at the, at the the contribution to the development of society and um, yeah and so so maybe uh, without the policies uh, we have to uh, we have to reassure uh, this discourse in a, in a society uh, in, 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 the, in the next uh, years um, yes indeed i think it's um you know we've, we've had agendas for widening participation it's hugely important but um the realities of that i think and and that is something that uh, the university i work for is is very much about um you know the it, we, we're called the university of opportunity because people you know they, they are sort of um supported to take those opportunities it's um it's something that might require very small steps for them at first and then you know to be able to realize these things are for me i can actually you know i never would have dreamed i could have been in a university at this stage of my life whether it's as a young person or as a you know somebody who has worked elsewhere and because many of our colleagues have been in this situation they're people who who 
studied and and learnt in the university and now teach in the university or research in the university. But the social sides of this, as well as the um, you know the learning online, how we might enact some of those for people to bring them into contact with the different groups that they would come into contact with. These are real challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and also the international side, because I, you know, I would say personally, it's um, working and, uh, you know, sort of um, teaching abroad. It, it, these things are hugely important. Um, the kind of conversation we're having now um, it, yeah. is terribly important in shaping exactly how, you know, we developers, you know, and that we're not just keeping things really narrowly in, yeah. you know, in our own context. To, to make it really a global endeavor to, to, to really demonstrate that the university is something that is caring for the whole, uh, the, the main questions uh, for us. Yes. Uh, yeah, we have lots of questions and I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, important uh, aspects you have raised, uh, raised Sarah. Um, But, but finally, I, I, I would want to talk, I wouldn't want to uh, ask Peter uh, a question. He has already related to the Journal of uh, Post-Digital uh, Science and Education. And I, I would really be curious, what do you think, um, as somebody who is really putting forward the term post-digital uh, so, so strongly, uh, I mean, do you, do you have new insights, new ideas, what, what post-digital means in the current situation? I mean, like a couple of years ago, when you, when you started with the idea of the journal and, and with the idea of putting forward post-digital as, a, as, a, as, a, as an important term for scholarly discussions, I really wonder, uh, do you have, what do you think about uh, post-digital in the current situation? Well, thank you very much. First, I need to thank the two of you because uh, since the very beginning of the journal, Sarah is an associate editor and Michael, you are a member of the editorial board, helping with reviews, supporting these efforts in many other ways. And I think by organizing talks and so on, and I think it's a, and I'm not doing this just to be polite. I'm doing this because I think that when we speak about concepts, we don't just speak about concepts. We also speak about development of communities. And we'll also speak about development of people who do not, we don't need to agree about everything. It would be really boring and it would not be a good community. But the community with similar interests, a community which is open to this type of discussions, And I think that the term post-digital is one of these terms. So, for instance, I was recently, a few months ago, another uh, member of the Associate uh, Board of Post-Digital Science and Education gave an interview and said that basically the term post-digital is nice but it's pretty much artificial because why now use the post when you're actually digital and all these critiques and then last week at the network learning conference this same person said openly uh well you know i was critiquing the, the term but since the lockdown i mean i've really been living a post-digital life and now this theory really kind of corresponds to my practice so maybe I was you know maybe I I, I was when I was reading the theory I, I felt it in a different way but now I feel it really like this and I really believe that the post-digital reality is now here so post-digital is a term which really describes a disappearing borders between our digital and non-digital lives like now Uh, there's a Sarah that I've known for many years. We work together. We actually Sarah and I meet Sarah more than than I meet many of my relatives who live in Croatia. I mean, and I'm speaking about face-to-face -face meeting, not about meeting online. Mm -hmm. And then with you, Michael, and with all these other wonderful people that I can't even see because their cameras are switched off. But the idea is that. Uh, These things are just, I don't know really anymore speaking with Sarah, for instance, at which point something happened face to face, at which point something happened online, it's all blurred. We don't, our relationship is completely 
mm. uh, bl has is blurring these these distinctions between the digital and the non-digital, and and we actually have now in in lockdown uh, witnessed not just online work at the universities, but we witnessed anybody who has reasonably small children or anybody who is maybe a grandparent already knows. I mean, these connections, many people have been describing these connections, for instance, between grandparents and grandchildren through things like Zoom or Skype, because generally elderly people are now the biggest risk population. So kind of they, grandparents often lose contact with their grandchildren. They haven't seen these kids for a few months and they miss the kids and the kids, kids miss the grandma. And this kind of, now you have this situation where some of these people have really done well in terms of continuing emotional engagement and continuing emotional attachment. When my son met, met my father, 10 days ago, and it was the first time they met face to face in nearly five, four or five months. There was no interruption because they were on Skype every second day. Mm -hmm. It was, grandpa was always here. He never, he never went away. He was never somewhere else. I mean, he was always around. So this is post-digital. This is the idea that we are kind of losing these borders between the digital and the non-digital. This is how I see it very yeah. broadly. And I do think that, yeah, that lockdown has showed, shown many, many, many different aspects of this post-digital post existence, which we are now trying to collect in the journal and so on. And as Sarah said, this, this session is a typical, I would say, post-digital example in which we, I mean, you kindly invited me. I was actually in, at, 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 at the conference in your city, at your university. Uh, I know where you come from. I'll definitely try to invite you at some point so that you, when we talk, when we talk, when I talk to you, I don't see just you. I also see, I also remember when I was taking a train from Kiln to, to Essen, when I was doing, I remember, you know, the streets, how they look, the pub, how it looks, this dinner in this industrial place which was really 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 beautiful and this kind of mixture between between a different types of emotions and different types of a, uh, 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 inputs impulses some of which come through the computer and some of which don't is i think what 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 what's post digital and now that and now we have this we came to the point in lockdown where we literally became so intertwined, these two things can, became, became so intertwined that, well, we can choose not to call it post-digital. And I, I understand people who say, I don't like the word, but however you want to describe this word, you know, Shakespeare's rose is a rose. However you want to describe this word, definitely there is something going on in this, with these portals between uh, the interaction between online and offline has changed for many people. And I think that this change is irreversible. And I, I'll tell you why I think it's irreversible and then I'll stop. Once you feel something, you cannot unfeel it anymore. So once you get jealous, it's very hard to stop being jealous. Once you get, uh, once you see once you realize that clouds are made of water and not of feather, it's impossible to unsee that clouds are made of water because you now you know that they are made of water. So I think that with the post-digital feeling is the same. That once people have realized these feelings and people like my father who are in their 70s, people even older, people very young, I think that we cannot unfeel this. I think that we cannot unsee this. And in some kind of way, the new normal will never be the same old normal because we cannot just go back to the, to, to, to the old normal because we are all different, we are all transformed people. 
Sorry, that was a bit long. No, no, no. Just as a counter thesis uh, before I go to Sarah, but as as a possible counter uh, uh, position could be like that you know uh, if people experience the current situation as a kind of a traumatic uh, experience, they 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 immediately want to 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 go back to their old habits, and they would immediately want to you know to 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 restart everything and, and to re re roll uh, the the old conditions. So so I'm not really sure whether, whether uh, the, what the future will bring. And, and, and I'm not sure how people really, teachers, students, really have experienced the current situation. It's very difficult to grasp from my, from my perspective. Sarah, what, what, what's your? Well, first of all, to comment that, um, you know, before too long, Peter will be um, publishing what will be some very interesting testimonies that people. Um, we'll really publish um, it together. <laughs> sorry? We will be publishing it together. Okay. You are yes, co-editing yes. this with me. And, uh, yes, we are co-editing the uh, the collection. But these were um, Peter caught these people in the moment, really, in uh, back in March, and uh, invited them to just literally share um, the kinds of things that were going on for them in that moment of lockdown, and their you know from people all around the the world. And uh, so it's it's not easily repeated because it's from in that moment, isn't it? And it's not something that, um, you know, we wouldn't say the same thing several weeks later on. But uh, they do capture this um, mm -hmm. incredibly, you know, changeable and uh, mm -hmm. all of the, um, the emotional side as well as the, um, you know, practical considerations about teaching, about family, um, and all of the things that were going on in, in people's lives. And so in that sense, they really capture this post-digital that um, Peter's just been referring to. And I found what you were saying really, really interesting just then, because it, it provoked thoughts really with me about um, how we have had many people over the years writing about the neoliberal university and the concerns about working harder than they ever believed would be possible and the perception whether it's the reality as well that we're all working many many longer hours than we should be and i'm interested in how lockdown has either altered perceptions of that or even intensified them and just to give a personal example of um you know, post-digital for me was, uh, it just popped into my head as you were talking, was, um, you know, at attending sort of meetings online, but scheduling in attending a funeral online in the middle of the, the, of the meetings. And, you know, I did this a, a Friday recently for an uncle, a very elderly uncle who had passed away, but passed away from the COVID. And I stopped what I was doing went into a webcast, watched the family in a, a place quite some miles away, the ones who could attend socially distancing in the, the service. And it was again, this, you know, these sorts of um, post digital ideas came to mind, even though you're, you know, uh, mourning a relative who, you know, had lived to be 94 and thinking about his life. Um, I was Googling the hymns because I didn't have a hymn sheet. So I just thought, oh, I'll have a sing along, you know, I, I need to have some words. And it's these kinds of things that are all mixed up with the fact that, you know, in the next room are other members of the family who didn't come. Now, if that had been a, a regular funeral, I would have got in the car. Some of us would have gone to it. We would have changed clothes. We would have sat in the building and, you know, done the things that you do. And the, these kinds of new ways of mixing everything up, and both the emotional side of that, as well as the potential opportunities for us, I think, to really reflect on what, you know, what, what it does mean. And, you know, whether we could change some of this so-called acceleration and uh, perhaps people would call it exploitation of, of neoliberal education. Um, so I don't know, and I'm also very interested to hear what each each of you think on on that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, that's a, a big question. I mean, obviously, I was thinking that I was on a funeral um, just this month, this 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 Monday, uh, and uh, we were lucky that this funeral could have taken place uh, a couple of weeks ago. Funerals were 
were not possible uh, to to do and uh, but honestly and, and this is a very personal <laughs> comment uh, for me it was the, the first situation where i went out of my office uh, my home office and i met with so many people uh, in in a room and, and 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 then i came the, the idea came up that uh, what we were talking about before that uh, you know there was the phase of the lockdown but now is the phase to, to to come back to life and 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 to a different life i mean mm -hmm. that was life before uh so so um, um I, I i really am curious about the question what what this has made with me <laughs> with us with our, with our, with teaching, learning, with with the way society operates, and uh, I don't, I, I think all the possible, um, um, there, are, there, are various routes are possible, and then I, I, I don't have a, re, a clear feeling what what's the, what the direction uh, is, what, what route we are taking. So um, I really was very interested in interested in reading all the some of the uh, papers uh, that the journal uh, is, has produced already on th this personal views, these reflected personal views uh, on on on, on uh, how how you're how we are coping with the crisis. And I really think the journal is uh, making a tremendous um, uh, impact uh, on on the discussion because I don't see any other journal who has was able to be so fast and uh, to and, and 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 i mean I, that's important nowadays i mean first of all it's important to really uh, to to bring out these articles but also to have this kind of mixture of of, of a personal emotional view but also to, to be able to bring this into a larger uh, conceptual framework uh, and i think really that is unique uh, and 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 also i think this is really a very important uh, a step the journalist is making in, in, in our scholarly discussion because in a way you, you, we could say this is a, a new way of, of writing uh, uh, scholarly papers, isn't it? I mean, uh, this has not yeah. been the typical a typical approach. I mean, you couldn't have written such personal papers before in, 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 a, in a Springer journal. <laughs> yes. yes. I would say, um, and and so now we have like twenty and, and more coming out. Uh, I guess uh, papers which are very different. Um, you can you can feel the cultural uh, roots uh, of the paper, the differences, and therefore I think this is also a very important step of the journal uh, made possible. And and other journals are still suffering with the question: How can we deal with the topic? Uh, but but as, as as Peter has also mentioned, I mean now we're in a, already in a different phase. <laughs> yes. So 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 things are really uh, very fast, and our scholarly journals typically are very slow. And, and I mean it's important that they are slow because we, we need this quality uh, improvement process. But um, yeah, but but so the journal I think really has a, an important function. You are making me think, Michael, that um, when you train teachers and train teaching in higher education and lecturers uh, do uh, certificates of, of teacher training, often you will open them up in a room to talk reflectively about things and, and many powerful conversations like this will come out. Um, but what we have had is this being published now in the journal in this very, very powerful way. And I think, uh, you know, given that we've something global going on like this it does you know it does require us in universities now to think really what does this mean you know and how you know how does this affect autonomy in terms of how we decide we work with our days and you know the different things that we do um you know to avoid say burnout because we're on constantly and we're online constantly but at the same time to you know to work in these ways that perhaps a lot of university regulation can sometimes lead us to believe, well, we're just following that. But these, these people are actually sharing, well, this is how I've adapted everything. These are the things I've done, you know, with my students and the way that I've, uh, you know, now conducted things. So I think there's something incredibly powerful there. Um, it does show that we don't need to be regulated into um, <laughs> non-existence, um, I think. But how it goes forward is, is going to be very interesting. So that, let's let's take this as as a final word because uh, 
uh, we have uh, tackled a lot of uh, issues. Uh, we have started a lot of questions and certainly this we will follow this uh, further on. Um, for the moment, uh, I want to say thank you for your very uh, in interesting inputs and, and, and it was very in uh, great to, to talk with you. So uh, thank you again and I will uh, close the, 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 the recording.